Well, welcome to the Unit 9 Test Review Podcast. For the most part, the dates in this unit are easy. The 17th century or 1600s is the Baroque era. Mannerism, however, does complicate the story a little. Mannerism is mostly a phenomenon of the last half, even last third of the 16th century, but Pintormo's descent from the cross is considerably earlier, and that date has shown up on past AP tests. Again, almost all the major works we studied in this unit, except for the manners, painting, and sculpture, date from the 17th century or 1600s, so that makes your lives easier. The Jesuits built their mother church toward the end of the 16th century, but the famous Gopher Baroque ceiling was painted almost a century later. Our Spanish colonial works are just a little later. The angel with an arquebus was uh, identified as 17th century or 1600s. Spaniard and Indian producer Mestizo takes us into the 18th century. And as I explained in my podcast, it's really more of an enlightenment work. But remember that new ideas traveled more slowly to the new world. The biggest influences on Spanish colonial art were Spanish and Italian artists. And in fact, the Mannerist influence is at least as strong as the Baroque influence. I don't know how picky the college board is going to be about dates when you write essays. My advice is to be sure you have two other identifiers besides dates, but also stick 17th century, 1600s Baroque into the hard drive. Okay, you've seen this review slide before, but I thought it was worth re-including here. Again, Baroque art displays movement and creative tension. Its sculptures often spiral around an axis. They always show movement, often show diagonals. Buildings, sculptures, and paintings are produced on a grandiose scale, and sometimes with over-the-top decoration. Remember those ceiling paintings. Painters love to compose with diagonals, sometimes crossing diagonals. Think of Judith slaying Holofernes, and these diagonals often reach from the foreground to the background. Think of some of those depositions you saw. Contrasts of light and dark contribute to the sense of art as theater, and spaces are designed to produce theater for art. I should have added this. Illusionism is very popular, again, especially with those ceilings. Art becomes multimedia. Think of the chapel that houses the ecstasy of St. Teresa with its stained glass ceiling, its metal rays, and the way the contrasting dark and light marble create the impression that it's actually set on a stage. The compositions, likewise, are often open. That is, the action is not fully contained by the frame, especially in the foreground where the viewer is standing. So you'll have several questions that will ask about attributes of Baroque art. For the most part, I think they're pretty easy to keep straight. The artist and title matching questions will be on the test. Note that the quiz is posted on Moodle. Each have two parts. Okay, some random questions. You know the drill here. Uh, there's also a lot of attribution on this test. Many of the artists, or in the case of manners and styles, are highly distinctive, so they invite attribution. Oops. So what European art period influenced this work, and indeed many Spanish colonial works? I talked about this a little bit a few minutes ago, and I'll offer another hint. Note the rather stiff pose, the emphasis on very fancy formal clothes, uh, the unrealistically small hands and feet. What's different about this angel compared with the way most angels are shown in art, even when they're armed? That's not a real tough question, although it offers an interesting insight into this particular work. And the materials used in painting show the influence of what other works. Now, this is not really a tricky question, but it's a warning to read questions carefully. It's asking about materials, not just subject matter. Uh, and the material here is oil paint. Oil painting was not indigenous to the New World, although Mayan and Aztec artists did, display, did employ fresco. So there are several questions on this work. First, let me remind you of some important information from the Khan Academy essay that I don't think I mentioned again in my podcast. The indigenous mother is dressed in a beautiful huipil, not sure how to pronounce that, a traditional woman's garment worn by indigenous women from central Mexico to parts of Central America. Note the lace sleeves and the sumptuous jewelry. So she is shown as a member of the indigenous aristocracy, as it were. Remember the viceroy's wife? 
wife, but note that her facial features and hand gestures are European, albeit with a dark skin. So those are big hints. Who are the figures? What is this painting about? What is the term for this kind of painting? And what was the function of this kind of painting? How do we know that the painter was trained in Europe? And hint, remember the point that I just made about materials. Okay, this is something I really should have included in my podcast, but didn't. The high drama of this work and its deliberate staging suggest that this artist was a pupil of which of our other artists? That's a very big hint, but you can also look it up. By the way, you will need to recognize the name of this artist, and I will tell you, I would not have until I prepped the unit this year. It was not an artist I knew by name. Uh, I'd also note that the Khan Academy... Uh, podcast did make the connection between the two artists that I've just talked about. There's another question about this painting, and it's one of those tricky accept questions. The painting uses all of the following illusionist techniques except. So know which techniques it uses, okay? Uh, I'm including a website that had what I thought was a very good discussion of Il Hesu and of this painting written by a British art history teacher who was about to take her students to Rome. So I've posted the link on Moodle as well. It wouldn't hurt to review this work. Again, be prepared for attribution questions. These are not the works you'll see, but I've included them for practice. So who painted these two works? Well, you should see the resemblance between the elevation of the cross on the left and the deposition painted uh, by Rubens, which you studied in your groups. The painting on the right is Minerva, that's the same as Athena, protecting peace from Mars, the god of war. Remember that Rubens often used mythological figures allegorically, and that as a diplomat, he hated war and longed for worked for peace, not real successfully. As for style, we see that strong sense of movement, the vivid swirling colors, and of course, those fleshy female nudes. So, how about these? Doubting Thomas and the beheading of John the Baptist. I'm not even going to answer this one, but be still my beating heart. Okay, uh, the painting on the right, excuse, on the left, is one of the many self-portraits by this artist. Uh, and on the left is his depiction of Aristotle with the bust of Homer. So, who is the artist and what other artist's influence do you see? What makes this portraitist stand out? What do we see in his faces that we don't always see in portraits, especially Manners portraits? And by the way, I've included a Manners portrait by Bronzino in the bottom center to help you think through the contrast. Remember that the Manners were obsessed with masks. Is our self-portrait artist interested in masks or maybe in stripping them off? So what's the name for this kind of work? Remember that the Spanish name was derived from the Japanese name. By the way, this is not the image you'll see. You'll see a similar but unfamiliar work, although you will see these images on some other questions. So what message was the painting on the top left sending? You need to know what it's about, not only the title, but also why this was a subject matter of interest to the rulers of colonial Mexico. Uh, where was it displayed? And where was the hunting scene on the bottom right displayed? Remember that the screen faced into two separate rooms. What special material was incorporated into these works? And what was the Spanish term for this? Here are some more general questions. You know the drill. So what's going on here? Who is the patron? And what does the patron want this and other paintings in the series to accomplish? And here's a comparative question that may force you to think back a little. What other required works depict mythological gods or allegorical figures interacting together with real people? Think way back. So I don't usually give you this much advance warning about an attribution question, but I thought this one was rather tough. The painting is, Vel is by Velazquez. But what earlier art painter has influenced this work? I think you'll be able to figure that one out. So what church is this? Note that the floor plan was not among the required images, but I did show it on my podcast. How does the plan of this church, which is actually quite clearly seen from the photo as well, how does the plan reflect the patron's priorities? What church functions did they wish to emphasize? And again, think back to your group exercise. I mean, all Christian churches are houses for worship, uh, for the Holy, you know, Holy Eucharist, but in different eras, different other aspects of Christian liturgy, practice, et cetera, tend to be emphasized. And that's what this is getting at. 
So how would you characterize this painting? And by the way, it will be coupled with another painting from from the last unit. It's a term for this kind of painting, and I'm going to give you a big hint. This is not an actual portrait. The woman is an identified, unidentified model. She's really a prop in a narrative. And what kind of painting is this? That's not a hard question if you know the work, which means if you finish the Dutch Baroque podcast either in class or on your own, and it's in your notebook as well. So neither of these portraits was in your reading. I don't think the one on the left was. I could be wrong. But I did talk about it in my podcast. You should be able to identify both artists and the country and culture and century that produced them. What kind of art did this country's customers want to purchase? And not just what you see here. Why? What similarities do you see in these two artists' style? Pay special attempt, uh, p attention not just to their use of light, but also to their brush strokes. What's our term for this kind of brush stroke? So this self-portrait doesn't actually show up in the exam, but again, there are questions about this artist's self-portraits. What do they reveal about the artists? What interests the artists about people? So the painting on the left used to be a big College Board favorite, and it even showed up on the College Board practice test, though it's no longer a required work, uh, because it showed evidence of what artist? Anyway, think about the influence of this work and know where the story comes from and why it was so popular in this artist's native country, and also, intriguingly, but if you think about it, not surprisingly, in the Protestant Netherlands. Rembrandt painted a scene from the story as well, actually a scene of our heroine at the banquet. Do you recognize that model? Back to the painting on the left. What techniques did the artist use for dramatic effect? Again, where did she get those ideas? You might also want to look back at the slide on Baroque art to remind yourself of Baroque art techniques. Where did this artist and the artist she's channeling here first work? What city is their work closely associated with, although they both worked in other places as well? I'm looking for a city that's the heart of the Counter-Reformation. You can't miss it now. What kind of a painting is this? I'm just looking for the genre. Uh, how was the artist influenced by her father's profession, which was? Okay, there are a lot of questions about this work, both from old AP tests and from new questions that were developed for the new exam. It's a big one. So make sure you know who the patron is. It's not a household name. Where do these patrons appear in the work? What was the religious ideological program behind this work? Who's the artist? What professional interest drove many of his works? You should have that one down by now. And especially it drove this one. So how does this background show up in the work's composition? And finally, what earlier period sculpture does this and other Baroque sculpture resemble? And since I kept flashing that, and you can think of El Greco, uh, you should know the answer. What makes this work a mixed media work? That is one that uses different materials. So the marble is pretty obvious. And by the way, just as a hint, the stone is all marble. It's not granite or limestone. Uh, here are a couple of more images from the chapel. I'm not sure you've seen these, but they should help you answer the question. Okay, you need to know this work thoroughly. The artist, the location, the time, the story, the techniques used to create drama, the shout out to an earlier artist. If I had to list five must-know paintings from this course, this one would be on the list, and not just because of my man crush. So who sculpted these non-required works? We did talk about them in class, and I could imagine them showing up as attribution questions on the AP exam. Remember that this artist was an architect as well as a sculptor, what is probably his most famous architectural work. And note that it was on the McConnell Jacobs required list, even though it wasn't on the College Boards list. So who's being depicted on the right and what other artists that we've studied also sculpt this figure? And how does this depiction differ from others we've studied? So think about general descriptions of Baroque art and Baroque sculpture. These are very typical in composition and intended effect. Last slide. Know what art historical period this painting represents, as well as the usual identifiers. What qualities identified as belonging to this particular period? The painting was commissioned for what kind of a setting? So good luck. In the next unit, we're going to race from Rococo art of the French court of the early 18th century, late, excuse me, late 17th century through the Impressionist art of the French upstarts of the late 19th century. So we're going to cover two centuries and a lot of art. I suggest you rest up.